Good evening and welcome to the Spirit and Life Bible Study. My name is Jonathan. Our reader is Cara tonight. And our topic is sheep. Now let me tell you a little bit about what the Spirit and Life Bible Study is, if I may. Spirit and Life Bible Study looks at the Bible through a Swedenborgian lens. The name comes from Jesus himself, who says that his words are spirit and they are life. Spirit meaning that his words have a spiritual and heavenly meaning and purpose, and life meaning that his words are alive and aim to bring us to life by teaching us how we are to live if we wish to become spiritual and heavenly. And since Jesus is the Word made flesh, what he says of his words applies to all the words of the Bible. They all teach who he is and how to get from hell to heaven. Now, with sheep, by the way, I send my greetings out to all of you online who are, who are uh, watching at this particular moment that I'm in or in some other moment that you're in and uh, people who are getting the audio and, and so on and so forth. Greetings to you all. I love the way the Lord brings us all together here for this event. Thank you for joining us. And um, the deal with sheep is that, um, well, two questions would be, does scripture imply that we should be like sheep? Hmm. And if so, what does that mean? It seems to me that in common parlance, in, in this part of the world at least, when people speak of other people as being sheep, they generally mean that they're gullible and stupid. Uh, in other words, that someone would, you know, almost anybody could ride into town and say, hey, everybody, and you just all follow them right out of town without thinking about it. Is that what we're supposed to be like? Is that what Jesus is calling us to be like? Or is there a difference between what we mean by sheep being stupid and gullible and what Scripture is talking about? What, what, what's the deal with sheep? Will you join me, friends? Let's open with a prayer, shall we? Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we thank you for bringing us together in your word, in your most holy name. You're the one God of heaven and earth. You bridge the worlds. We ask that you be with us this evening, Lord, and always open our eyes, open our minds, open our hearts, so that we may see you in the pages of your word. Amen. Thank you, friends, for coming. Very good to see you. Mm. The first place we really should look when we're talking about sheep is a very familiar parable in the New Testament. If you could turn to Matthew chapter 25. This is a very basic kind of scripture. But it tells us a lot about who sheep are. Uh, I'm thinking of Matthew chapter 25 and starting at the 31st verse. There are three parables in here, and this is the third of these parables. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Oh, now wait a minute. So you're saying that sheep and goats both mean nations, right? In uh -huh. other words, sheep is a metaphor for human beings. That's what I gather that that means. And you have, in effect here, two different types of people that you're talking about, sheep and goats. So let's learn some more about this. This is very familiar to most of you, I'm sure, friends. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Yes, and may I draw your attention to those personal pronouns in there it's of interest to me that the sheep are on his right hand, but the goats are on the left. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say his left, it's just the left. It, it's just an interesting little detail there, but uh, go on. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, mm -hmm. Come, you blessed of my father, mm. inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Wow, so they're gonna inherit this kingdom and they're blessed of the Father, okay? For Why I, is that? For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. 
I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord. Oh, and see, it's, it calls them the righteous, doesn't it? Mm. Calls them, that's interesting. The it right calls man. them the right. So sheep equal the righteous. Isn't that right? Yeah. And then the righteous will the answer righteous him. The righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. But that's a low threshold, just even one. <laughs> one, per, you know, one you ever did least. this to one person, yeah. you, you, you get to be in the sheep classification mm. and you get to inherit this wonderful kingdom. Go on. Then he will also say to those on the left hand. The left, that's right. Depart from me, you cursed, oh. into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. That sounds bad. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. Mm. I was a stranger and you did not take me in. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Yes, they, they realize this is all could be put under the heading of ministering. Then he will answer them saying, assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment but the righteous into eternal life. Yes, it's a very powerful statement. And what it seems to be saying, it's pretty hard to escape the message that the sheep are people who do for others and the goats are people who don't do for others, who, who don't take care of others' needs. So a couple of things are clear there. Number one is that sheep uh, in this passage mean people. Um, and apparently, this is not an arbitrary, you know, it's not as though God sat on his throne and said, I like you, I like you, I don't like you, I don't like you, and just went down the list like that. The, the, it, the, it wasn't a judgment on the basis of some arbitrary thing or, you know, nationality or whatever, you know, it wasn't on the basis of that. It was on the basis of their actions. That's uh, the way that they treated others was how they were judged. And so even though the judgment seems harsh about everlasting punishment and so on and everlasting fire, uh, isn't it according to people's choices? Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? It's not as though there was something intrinsic in people that was intrinsic in one person that made them a sheep and something intrinsic in someone else that made them a goat. It was a choice of how they behaved. And since everybody has the choice to behave one way or another way, uh, this judgment is the, the people who are sheep are people who are judged to have acted in a way that benefited their neighbor. And uh, the goats were those who had not benefited them in that way. Swedenborg's analysis of this passage is very interesting because he adds a fascinating element. He says that both the goats and the sheep, these are not, they're, they're referred to as the nations. And what the nations mean here is all, all the people who are religious or in some sense churched and, and particularly Christians. And uh, so these are not just everybody. Uh, it, it's a subset of the human race and that the goats are those who had teachings. They had the word, they, they had been taught things, they didn't practice it. You know, it's, it, it's an interesting um, analysis to say that the goats are, are people who knew better and didn't follow the teachings that they'd been given. But uh, let me ask you, is it sort of blind stupidity to feed someone who's hungry or to give someone drink who's thirsty? Or is it just you, all you have to do is just like follow the herd. Everybody visits people in prison and you just get in the herd. 
<laughs> and you go into the prison and visit. You know, no, the herd doesn't go visit people in prison. You have to kind of leave the herd to do these things. You know what I mean? In other words, this reputation that sheep are people who just follow others and are stupid and gullible doesn't really fit this passage because it's actually talking about a kind of a somewhat uncomfortable kind of giving in, in some case. You know what I mean? It's, you have to kind of go outside your comfort zone uh, to fulfill some of these things uh, in order to do for others. So I, I already think it doesn't really fit uh, this idea that it, it's just stupidity and gullibility. I don't think scripture, I think scripture does say, already we can answer our questions, that it does say that we should be like sheep. It says there's a lot that rides on this, uh, but, and it says that we have the power, to, it implies that we have the power to make that choice, um, but what it means is not a blind obedience or just ignorant, you know what I mean, just sort of go with where, wherever the tide is going. Or, you know, I don't think that's what these sheep are. Okay, let's look at some other passages. Let's turn all the way to the left and go back to Exodus, the second book in, in your Bibles. Well, I want to go to chapter 23. Because there is a passage about following a crowd that you may be aware of. 23 verse 2. This is shortly after the Ten Commandments were given, and these are the other commandments that, that went along with the Ten Commandments. You shall not follow a crowd to do evil. Ah, period. Oh. Huh. Don't follow a crowd. Doesn't that mean, don't mean what we say in common part, don't be what we call a sheep. Like, mm -hmm. don't, you know, don't just sort of walk in some herd that's going in some, just because everybody's doing it or whatever. Uh, don't follow a crowd to do evil. Now, the sheep in that New Testament parable, were they doing evil? whether they were in a crowd or they weren't, they were doing good. They were the righteous, right? They were, they were blessing other people. Um, so sheep are kind of the opposite. Scriptural sheep are the opposite of people who would follow a multitude to do evil. I would humbly submit. Um, let's look at, uh, oh, let's turn to the Psalms in the middle of your book, shall we? I just want to quickly look at uh, three passages. Psalm 79. Verse 13. These are just three passages about the issue of, you know, some people take the Bible very, very literally. And they might say, hey, sheep means sheep. It's not talking about people. Well, 79 verse 13. What do we read there? So we, your people, and sheep of your pasture. Oh, people equal sheep, right? It's right there. We're pe your, your people and sheep of your pasture will do so and so and so. We'll give you thanks forever and show forth your praise and so on. Uh, have a look at Psalm 95. Psalm 95. Can't find it. Here it is. Verse 7. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. People equal sheep. Yep, uh, makes that point again. Uh, and have a look at Psalm 100, just probably over the page for you. Mm -hmm. This beautiful passage I love very much, verse 3 there. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. There it is again. And isn't it interesting that that's paired there with the idea that the Lord made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Okay, so that's just to say that people equal sheep. Turn to the right and let's go into Isaiah, which, which comes up pretty soon there. And I want to go to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53, it's... it's kind of a challenging chapter for, for people taking a, a Swedenborgian view of Scripture. I want to zero in because it sounds so much like that Jesus is separate from God and there's going to be a sacrifice and so on. 
Uh, we've had a whole Bible study on this before. Tonight I just want to look at verses 6 and 7, but very much it, in the, it's, it's so much of it sounds like the crucifixion. You know, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed, it says in verse 5 and then verse 6. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Okay, so sheep are capable of going astray, right, in the language of Scripture. They, they, they're good people, but they're capable of going astray. But it's interesting how they go astray. Uh, do they all go astray together in one waddling herd like a <laughs> creature with a hundred legs? No, they all go their own way, don't they? We turned everyone to his own way. They, and, and we'll see elsewhere that there's passages about the sheep being scattered. You know, if, so it's not a herd, it's not following a crowd to do evil. It, it's when they go astray, they're, they're off on their own. Um, so it's a little bit different than that, that common concept. And look at verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Huh. He was oppressed and afflicted. And obviously Christians read this to mean Jesus. They think about the crucifixion and so on. He was oppressed and afflicted, but he opened not his mouth. Okay. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. Oh. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. Yes, that's right. So he was brought as a lamb to the... So, so what is sheep like in that passage? It seems like what is sheep and lamb like is that he did not fight back. Mm -hmm. Am I right? I mean, is that the way you read that? It seems like uh, he didn't open his mouth. And we see this literally in the crucifixion that that Jesus doesn't, you know, there are times when he's challenged or asked things and he doesn't say anything. Uh, he's brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as sheep for shears is dumb, so he opens not his mouth. We're silent. Um, interesting. Okay, so sheep. So part of what Scripture seems to be talking about with sheep is that they're a creature that will not fight back no matter how bad it gets. Uh, there are stories that you've probably heard, um, you know, even, you know, tigers and lions can be to some extent uh, tamed and, and controlled, but you've probably all heard the stories of where even someone who cares for them, owns them, sees them every day, one day they'll just, nah, you know, they suddenly just flip out and just eat them or, or you know, or whatever. And, and um, that's what your sheep don't do. You know, you, a sheep is, is something that will, ne no matter what is going on, even if it's being killed, it will not attack you. You know, it's, it's just not in its nature. It doesn't have that kind of predatory thing. The, the, the tiger or the lion, on the other hand, can go many, many days without attacking, but that hasn't left its nature. It's still capable of that act, you know, whereas a sheep, I would submit, is incapable of that act. So that's something to think about in, t in terms of our pondering who the sheep are. And there's one more passage, or is there, is there one more here uh, that I want to look at before we move on with this? Um, uh, let's go all the way to the back of your Bible, not quite to the book of Revelation. If you get to go to the Revelation at the back and then back up, you'll go through the epistles of John and get to the epistle to Peter. I want to get to 1 Peter chapter 2. Now this is a challenging, interesting passage here. 1 Peter chapter 2 and it starts at the 18th verse. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. What interesting advice. <coughs> If you have a master, you know, if you're a servant and you have a master, be submissive to your master. In other words, don't 
don't talk back, don't hassle them, don't have a big ego or whatever. Just be submissive. Even if your master is no good, you know, even if he's harsh, uh, you're still supposed to be submissive. Mm, go on. For this is commendable, if because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering, suffering wrongfully. Okay, so hear what this is saying, that, that it's good, it's praiseworthy, if you're following your conscience, if your conscience, in other words, if you read this teaching, and this teaching said be submissive to your master, and so you're submissive to your master, and as a result you endure grief and you suffer wrongfully, unjustly. Uh, go on. For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? You see what it's saying? So if you blew it, if you did something wrong, and then you're beaten for it, and you're thinking to yourself, I'm taking this commendably well, <laughs> you know. Uh, <laughs> this is saying, uh, that's nothing to write home about. I mean, okay, great, but you know, <laughs> you did something wrong, you know. <laughs> the fact that you're taking it patiently, uh, that's not so great, but. But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. Yes, okay, so there's a difference between doing what's mm -hmm. evil or doing what's wrong and then patiently taking your licks or whatever you want to call it, uh, as opposed to doing something right and suffer for it uh, because your master is harsh or, or something else, but it's not your fault. That's acceptable to God. Go on. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. An example. <clears throat> that you should follow his steps. Who committed no sin. He committed no sin, okay? Nor was deceit found in his mouth. He did not deceive others. He committed no sin, and he didn't deceive others. Okay, go on. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. I think that helps me understand what that Isaiah 53 was talking about, that that idea of going silently, that when he's reviled, he does not, you know, it's such a human instinct. I'm sure you've, you, you've done this at some point in your you know, in your less mature years, dear friends, uh, where, you know, somebody strikes at you and you just strike back, you know, it's kind of an instinct and, and you, you lash out or something. Uh, but when he was reviled, he did not revile, you know, Jesus didn't going through the crucifixion, he wasn't pouring out verbal abuse on, on everybody. He, he just, you know, he, he, just, he just took it, even though it was unjust. Go on. When he suffered, he did not threaten. Aha, uh -huh. so he suffered, but he wasn't sort of, <laughs> I'm gonna get you back, you're gonna get your, you know. He, he, so he suffered, so this is an example to us, okay? He did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Yes, interesting phrase, huh? So, so as if, you know, that divine eye that's over all things will see that the, this was righteous who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Meaning the cross, of course. That we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Oh, that's Isaiah 53, isn't it? That we should live to righteousness and... For you were like sheep going astray. Oh but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So can you see a couple of reasons why I would include this passage tonight that, that it ends with a mention of sheep after this business of being submissive even under people who are not good or not treating you well, uh, but being principled, not eye for an eye, not tooth for a tooth, not sort of, you reviled me, I'm gonna revile you back, or you're making me suffer, so I'm gonna threaten you, or whatever. Uh, does that, is that easy? Do you just sort of follow your gut instinct to do that? Uh, no, that's a very disciplined response, isn't it? You've gotta really inculcate some teachings uh, to be able to maintain in that situation. In fact, in a certain way, I think uh, the Lord is the only person who could have undergone the crucifixion and not lashed out. You know, I think every other person would have responded more poorly than he did. It was his divine love and the divine truth that gave him that strength so that he did not revile, he didn't take revenge or whatever. And what is he compared to? What, 
there's an animal, there, there's a couple of different animals, but he's called a lamb, isn't he? More than any other animal uh, that he's likened to, he's mm -hmm. compared to a lamb, not just a sheep, but a lamb. Would you say Jesus was gullible? Would you say Jesus was stupid? He's compared to a lamb. So whatever people mean by sheep in common parlance today, it doesn't fit who Jesus was. You know, what's sheep like about him is this principled, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to just tit for tat. You know, I'm not going to just take revenge or whatever. Uh, I'm going to act on principle. So is Jesus following something when he does that? Absolutely. He's following that teaching of the law. You know, he's following something principled, but it's not a herd and it's not following a crowd to do evil. He's following something that's guiding him from within uh, of how to do good and, and how to be righteous, even in the face of torment from others. Um, okay. Excellent. Let's turn back to the middle of your Bible and go to Psalm 23. We, you know, we're hitting all the favorites tonight. It's sort of a, you know, February special here. Cheer you up and greatest read hits. all your favorite uh, <laughs> biblical passages, the greatest <laughs> hits. That's right. And uh, Psalm 23. How could we not read Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yes, the paths of righteousness, not the paths of gullibility or stupidity or whatever, in the paths of righteousness. And he leads. That's right. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, mm. for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That does not come naturally. You know, that, that's not just following a natural herd instinct or something. It, it's a principled following of the Lord that brings you to that state. Let's go ahead and read the rest. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. Mm. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And what was <coughs> said of the sheep in Matthew 25? Uh, the, it would be eternal life, right? We'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, following this kind of path uh, takes you into eternal life. It's a disciplined path. It's a difficult path, but it takes you there. Okay, turn to the right. And in Psalm 119, which is the longest chapter, I believe, in all of Scripture, uh, look at the very last verse, 119. 119, verse 176. 176. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Aha, astray and lost. Hmm. I've gone astray like a lost sheep. So all is not perfect in the sheep community, right? The <laughs> scriptural sheep are capable of going astray. They're capable of getting lost. And we'll talk a little more about that in a bit. Um, go on. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. Aha. Uh -huh. I've gone astray like a lost sheep, but seek me, David says to God, for I do not forget your commandments. Mm. Okay, see if you can hold that in your mind. Let's turn to the right to, we'll go through Isaiah this time and go to Jeremiah chapter 50. Hmm. Hmm. Verse 6. Verse 6, how do you know? My people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray. Oh, now the plot thickens. Who led them astray? Their shepherds. Oh, bad, oh, bad shepherds. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. Oh, so that is something that can happen to sheep. How do sheep go astray? Bad shepherding. Okay. Mm -hmm. They have turned them away on the mountains. They have gone from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. Mm. And look at uh, verse 17. Israel is like scattered sheep. Yes. 
The lions huh. have driven him away. Yes, that's right. And then he's subject to, you know, first the king of Assyria devoured him, and then the Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon broke his bones. Um, and then in verse 19, it says, I'll bring Israel again to his habitation. He'll feed on Carmel and Bashan, and his soul shall be satisfied on Mount Ephraim and Gilead. Um, that's right. Um, so Israel is compared to a scattered sheep. And my people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds caused them to go astray. They forgot their... Okay, so sheep are subject to certain kinds of problems. Uh, let's turn to the right to Ezekiel chapter 34. The next book over. 12? Well, unfortunately, we have to read the Ten. entire chapter, I think. Okay. <laughs> and the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Uh -huh. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. I see part of what sheep do is they are, are scripturally, <coughs> with apologies to vegans and so on, uh, the way that the sheep are presented in scripture is that they are a source of food and a source of clothing, right? They give you wool, uh, they give you the meat and uh, go on. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. Uh-huh. The weak you have not strengthened, oh. nor have you healed those who were sick. Wow, we're back in Matthew 25, aren't we? Go on. Nor bound up the broken, okay. nor brought back what was driven away, mm. nor sought what was lost. Uh -huh. But with force and cruelty you have ruled them. I see. And what was their condition at that time? So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. Oh, okay. So either you could lead them astray or when there's no shepherd... Did it say, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered, something like that? Or maybe we're going to read that in a little bit. Uh, yes. Okay, go on. And they became food for all the beasts of the field mm. when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. Yes, my flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth and no one was seeking or searching for them. Yes, this is, this is a problem. And you notice again what sheep do when they go wrong. I, I've searched in vain to find any passage about evil sheep or sheep who were in iniquity or they were wicked or doing wrong or whatever. They're, they're always good. They only suffer from three bad words, you know, lost, scattered, astray. You know, that's, that's what happens to, to sheep. And it's interesting to me to see in these passages that uh, they're either all together and they're in a good state or they're off by themselves. Right? That mm. seems to be the two positions that, that sheep can get into. And we'll mm. attempt to talk about the meaning of that in a little bit. Go on. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. That's right. As I live, says the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey and my flock became food for every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, nor did my shepherds search for my flock, mm. but the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed the flock, uh -oh. feed my flock. Therefore, O shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against the shepherds mm. and I will require my flock at their hand. I will cause them to keep, I will cause them to cease feeding the sheep yes. and the shepherds shall feed themselves no more. Yeah, they're going to be fired in effect, right? <laughs> For I will deliver my flock from their mouths that they may lo no longer be food for them. Yes, okay, so they're being preyed on. And part of why the sheep are subject to being preyed on is that they won't fight back, you know? Mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't bite, they don't attack, they won't kill or whatever. And so they're, they're vulnerable in this way. Go on. For thus says the Lord God, Indeed, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. This is a wonderful passage for the oneness of God because this is obviously God talking about coming into this world as Jesus to seek his sheep, right? Mm. Go on. As a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep, 
Mm. So will I seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. Yes, I, I love that expression because somehow it takes thousands of years of history and just makes it one bad afternoon. Um, <laughs> you know, just scattered in a cloudy and dark day. I'm going to seek them out and, and I'll bring them out. Go on. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land. Uh huh. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, in the valleys, and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in good pasture, and their fold shall be on the high mountains of Israel. There they shall lie down in a good fold, and feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek what was lost, and bring back what was driven away, bind up the broken and strengthen mm. what was sick. Mm. But I will destroy the fat and the strong and feed them in judgment. Yes, and uh, we, the, the whole chapter is about this. Let's just skip down to um, verses 30 and 31 at the end of the chapter there. But uh, basically it turns out very well. They're going to be safe. They're going to know who the mm. Lord is and all that. Their flock will be saved. And Verse 30. Thus they shall know that I, the Lord their God, am with them. And they, the house of Israel, are my people, says mm. the Lord God. You are my flock, the flock of my pasture. You are men, and I am your God. Yeah, could it be clear? Sheep equal people. Mm -hmm. All the way through here, many, many passages. Sheep equals people, and, and Scripture is repeatedly talking about people as sheep. And these sheep are subject to getting lost, going astray, being scattered, but the Lord came into the world to gather them together and to come out and seek them, seek the lost. Good, 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 good. Okay, now if you turn to Matthew in the New Testament and then turn back through Malachi to Zechariah, there's just one more passage I want to read in the Old Testament here. Zechariah chapter 13, close to the end of Zechariah. <coughs> And we want to do verses 7 to 9. Here's that passage I was just referring to. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion, says the Lord of hosts. Mm. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. Yes, strike the shepherd and the sheep. So this too will have... It, the sheep are beings that are following this shepherd, right? That's one of their primary characteristics that they're following. It's not a dumb or a blind following, but they're following the shepherd. And if the shepherd gets struck down, then the sheep are scattered because they, who do I follow now kind of thing, you know, go on. Then I will turn my hand against the little ones and it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two thirds in it shall be cut off and die but one-third shall be left in it. Mm. I will bring the one-third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, mm. and test them as gold is tested. Mm. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people. And each one will say, the Lord is my God. That's the ultimate sheep and shepherd relationship, isn't it? Mm. It's like, you know, the shepherd says, you're, you're my people, and the sheep says, you're, you're my God. That's... That's what Scripture is talking about as sheep. Uh, okay, into the New Testament. Let's see if we can flash through some of these. Let's go to Matthew chapter 10. There's so many good uh, sheep passages. Let's go to chapter 10, verse 5, when Jesus sent out the 12, 12 these, disciples. These 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Oh, interesting. Okay, so they were sent out to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Go on. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Yes. So the, the 12 were sent out to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Similar theme to what we just read in the Old Testament. How about Matthew 12, starting at verse 9. Now when he had departed from there, he went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man who had a withered hand. 
And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath, that they might accuse him? Then he said to them, What man is there among you who has one sheep, and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out? This is another problem that sheep suffer from, in, in addition to being lost and going astray, is falling in a pit. Okay? <laughs> Go on. Of how much more value than then is a man than a sheep. Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Mm. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched, he stretched it out, and it was restored as whole as the other. Yes, thank you. Very fun. And then Matthew 15. At the top. Verse 24. Oh, verse 24. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Okay, good, 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 good. And how about Matthew 26, verse 31, 26. Then Jesus said to them, This is the crucifixion, you know, this right after the Last Supper, and um, they just sung a hymn. Mm -hmm. and then Jesus said this, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Mm. But and that's referring to the disciples, mm. right? He, he's saying that he's describing the disciples as sheep, and that they're, when the shepherd is struck, they're going to be scattered. Mm -hmm. But what does he say in verse 32? But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Mm. Yes. And... Uh, Let's go back to Matthew 18. I missed one in there. Mm -hmm. Got to read this. I mean, it's our special on the best, you know, the best <laughs> of the best. Uh, 18 verse 10. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. Mm. For I say to you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my father who is in heaven. For the son of man has come to save that which was lost. Hmm. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? Hmm. And if he should find it, assuredly, I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the ninety-nine that did not go astray. Hmm. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Yes, and let's turn to Luke and look at the parallel passage to that in Luke 15. There's just one little detail that comes up in Luke 15. Let's just pick up the first verse there. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. Mm. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until mm. he finds it? Mm. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. Ah, this important detail, not in the other version of the story, that he lays it on his shoulders, okay? And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Verse 7. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Now you knew it was going to wind around to repentance <laughs> in here somewhere. So the sheep being lost, it's repentance that's needed to get back, right? That's mm. how the sheep get unlost. Mm. Very important thing. And uh, I think our last scripture here is in John chapter 10. Okay. which is another one of those chapters. So turn to the right, and it's uh, the entire chapter is about the sheep situation, but we'll just start at the first verse. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Mm. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Mm. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Very important detail. They know his voice. Right. 
yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Mm. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever come, be, whoever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Mm. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Mm, yes. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. Now, this is an interesting little somewhat non-literal detail. Yes, wolves will come down on sheep, but generally when they catch them, they don't then scatter them you know, they kill them and eat them, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it's interesting that in the, in the correspondence of the story that what the wolf does to these sheep is scatter them. It catches them, but scatters them. Go on. <clears throat> the hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. <coughs> and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. That's right, one flock and one shepherd. So this lost and sca scattered, uh, the Lord's going to come and move it in the other direction, bring everybody together so they're not scattered anymore. And let's look down at verse uh, 24. Yeah, let's just read this. So this is we'll find John in scripture 10, in still? John 10. Yep. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you and you did not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. Aha. Uh -huh. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Yes, that's what they follow. The sheep follow him, right? They don't follow a crowd to do evil. They're not gullible and stupid. They're following the Lord. Go on. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. And that's right. What a beautiful picture. And that's very similar to the image of carrying them on the shoulder. The shoulder means that divine power and that if you can picture uh, what the divine shoulder corresponds to, once you get picked up on that shoulder, you will never be dropped. You know, that's the permanent situation. You will be carried by that divine power forever. Um, good. Thank you very much, dear reader. So let's talk a little bit about these things. I've made a lot of promises of what I'll talk about. Uh, let's see whether I can fulfill them all. Um, okay. Sheep. Uh, Swedenborg explains mean people who are primarily about doing good works. They're people who are doing good and loving things for others. And this is depicted in the fact that sheep give not only wool, which is such a tremendous, it still has it, is there anything that rivals wool for remaining warm when it's wet and, you know, in the coldest climates? Isn't that what people want to have? Uh, that, that wool is just amazing and the sheep give that wool and they also uh, are you know they provide meat and uh, they can be eaten which is the ultimate sacrifice and so on they're useful they're useful and they give themselves and they don't attack and they're not nasty and and whatever um, this is the this is the nature of sheep they're subject, however, to being scattered. So they're people who are primarily in good works. And then as a result of that, as a result of being charitable and doing loving things for others, which we saw in Matthew 25, they did all those good things. That's what the sheep are. They're people who are doing for their neighbor, whoever, whoever that is. They didn't even realize it. You know, they were sort of innocent in that response, weren't they? Because mm -hmm. they said, when were you? I don't remember. 
did I? You know, mm. uh, but they've been just doing these good things all the time for people, not realizing that it had a huge effect like that, a bigger effect than they realize. Uh, they have those good works, and that also leads them into an understanding or into truth. When you're doing good, you have a hunger for the truth. Like in other words, if you want to love someone, you need to understand them to figure out how to love them effectively. Um, uh, anything you love, anything you're passionate about, you want to learn more about that so you can be better at it. And so sheep have this need and this desire for the truth, for instruction, because they're people who follow instructions, even when nobody else is following them. They're internalized, but they need that information. How is it that they go astray or get scattered or whatever? Well, if they don't get the right instruction, you know, if the teaching is bad, the Lord came into the world at a time when uh, the, the teaching was very bad. Uh, the Lord accused the Pharisees of, of hypocrisy, of being inwardly evil and outwardly preoccupied with all these little details, in, in, perfectly imaged in the fact that they wanted to shut him down from healing somebody on the Sabbath because there's a rule about the Sabbath, you're not supposed to do any work. You know, that's a typical thing of making that rule and their understanding of it more important than loving somebody who needs help. And isn't it poignant that the Lord said, well, if you have a sheep who's fallen in a pit, you'd get them out, leave me alone, you know? And, and, he, and he does the miracle and, and helps the person. Uh, the Lord came to seek the lost. They, when, when, when they go lost, when they don't have a shepherd, when sheep don't have uh, some system or some truth that they're following, they're doing, they're doing good things. They're still sheep. You know, they're still producing wool and, and good things and so on. Uh, but they're subject to wandering or going off in their own direction because they don't have that guidance that would keep them together. You know, and so they wander. One parable said the wilderness. Another one said on the mountains. He goes and seeks that one who's lost. Um, that's a lack of truth. Like they, they're very good in the good works department, but they may have a lack of understanding or they may have been fed bad teaching and that's how they went, uh, got lost or fell in the pit or went astray. Uh, and the Lord comes to seek them. And what the Lord means is he is the divine truth itself. He's the word made flesh. And so he is what they want to follow. It's his voice that is the truth. And when they hear that voice, when they realize, oh, that's the voice of divine love. You know, I can hear that in the word. I know what that is. Uh, then they follow that and form that bond that's just unbreakable. Uh, it's quite the opposite of... Um, just being gullible or dumb or being, you know, easily swayed or, or something like that. Even the going astray and the being scattered or getting lost is a temporary condition. Uh, when the Lord, when the truth, when the shepherd appears, uh, they're found and they're found permanently. And that's what happens there in Matthew 25, where they're called into that everlasting kingdom that's prepared for them. Um, they go off into everlasting life and are, are with the Lord. Um, we are human beings. Why would Scripture liken us so relentlessly to an animal? It's rather odd, isn't it? But human beings, the implication seems to be that human beings uh, have a choice of what animal they would like to be. We have a choice. You know, the animal, the, a, a literal physical sheep has no choice about being a sheep. And one of the things that, to my mind, separates animals from human beings, a uh, very unpopular thought, I guess, these days, uh, but uh, something that separates animals from uh, humans is that humans can choose what kind of animal to be. They have some choice about it. It takes a long time to make that choice, but they have some choice about it. And this is why it's a matter of our salvation and why it's so important is that our actions actually determine whether we're sheep-like or goat-like, you know, uh, whether we are doing good to others or not. And it requires tremendous discipline. It talks about the sheep being led to the slaughter. 
I think that slaughter is partly, you know, um, Paul says, I die daily. That's temptations. That's the pain, you know, it's a painful path to follow these rules, to actually leave the rest of the world and just, you know, follow the Lord, or whatever can be a painful path sometimes. Um, uh, but there's a sense in which they're not um, complaining. They're not, you know, the sheep are not screaming or, uh, or whatever. Um, they're just, they're going along in that direction because they realize, what did it say in Isaiah 53? As a sheep before its shearers is silent. Um, you know, uh, the Lord is preparing these people to be useful, to produce this wool, to be those who love their neighbors. A big difference between human beings and literal physical sheep, uh, I know that at all animals are different and have their different personalities and so on, but the range of human sheep is extremely broad. There's like an infinite or unlimited number of ways of being a sheep. It's not at all, it has nothing in common with being gullible and stupid, and it doesn't have to do with all being exactly alike and wearing the same clothes and saying the same things. You know, the Lord, with each person who's becoming a sheep, he prepares them to be different than other people are because each one has your own particular kind of wool or your own thing that you're giving to the human race, your own gift that you have to give. Uh, so sheep may be submissive and they may appear. I think the Lord deliberately uses this image. How, have you not read, friends, that the highest angels appear like little children? You know, they, they seem like little children. Uh, I think there's something that can appear deceptively weak in those who are following the Lord, those who are innocent in this way. But actually there's tremendous strength in what they're doing. They're you know, it takes tremendous strength from the Lord uh, not to fight back, not to take revenge, not to revile when you're being reviled, not to threaten when you're suffering and so on. Uh, it's a, it's a, a goal from which we all fall short and so forth, but it's a, it's a direction in which we can go in our lives. And the word is his voice. That's what will lead us. It's curious to me. I don't know what it means that the Lord will lead us out of the sheepfold. Isn't that interesting? We're in the sheepfold. And he said, I'm the door of the sheepfold, but I'll lead them out because they know my voice. That's interesting. Not sure what that means exactly, uh, but the primary image is very clear. And, and lots of Christians have seen this over the centuries, that the idea of following the Lord through thick and thin, trying to find the Lord, and then when you find him, just hanging on to that for, for dear life. Um, it's very good to know that he's got that power of his shoulder, that whole divine power. He's seeking us. What did that one, was it in the Psalms, where he said, seek your servant. You know, I'm a lost, I'm a lost sheep. You seek, seek your servant. As we're seeking the Lord, the Lord is seeking us. Um, I think that's all I have to say on that subject. But, uh, but um, we... You know, it's not about being stupid and gullible. We live in a culture where people just love the idea of rogue individuals who go crazy. The, the policeman's called into the office and he has to hand over his badge and his gun, but he keeps working on the case anyway because, you know, the rule breakers and the renegades and everything. And we just love that. We love the individual who goes rogue and everything. Um, uh, I think what Scripture is talking about is people, and that kind of person may well be following something. Uh, but I think there's something very beautiful about this sheep-like attitude that the Lord is looking for from us, an innocence of heart, a goodness that is not compromised. There's no circumstance <coughs> under which you will do what's evil or what comes from hell. Thank you, friends. Let's close with a prayer. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we thank you, Lord God, for bowing the heavens and coming down, coming into this world to seek us, calling out with the voice of your word, calling out on that dark and cloudy day, calling us to you with that infinite voice, with that current, that stream of providence, 
pulling us in your direction, Lord. We pray that we be able to hear your voice, to recognize you, to be found by you, to be placed on your shoulder so that we may be safe with you forevermore. And please, Lord, as well, we pray that you show us uh, what is not sheep like in us, what we can do in order to be more of that way that you would wish us to be, and also show us that spirit in others, Lord. Who are the other sheep that you're bringing together because there must be one fold, one flock, one shepherd. Our Father who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's keep on repenting, friends, that we may be found. Mm.